morning. Shall I start? Good morning. Uh, it's, uh, I want to take us back to the topic of uh, edge defects, which I had started yesterday. We'll uh, begin with that and then work our way through some more topics today. So we'll look at uh, defects, particularly edge and screw dislocations. And then we'll look at uh, surface type of uh, defects that I talked about, planar defects. And finally, we'll uh, just mention volume defects. And then I'll take up some of the structure issues when you have defects in a structure, how that uh, affects the structure. And uh, then time permitting, I'll do a sort of a quick run through phase diagrams. And that should cover a sort of a quick review of some basic properties uh, and ideas that we need for this course. So let me go back to dislocations. I had said that there are two kinds. There's edge and screw. And the edge dislocation was represented basically as an extra half plane that is there. Okay. It's as if one plane is missing, the half of the plane is missing there. And as a consequence, this area, uh, the atoms are pulled together in the lower plane, over, uh, in the upper plane here, and in the lower plane, they are spread out around this place. And I said that the symbol we use for the uh, edge dislocation is an inverted T. I think we had got so far. I want to use a model that I can show you that will probably help us understand better what we are seeing. If we can look in front here, we can see, uh, well, it's not in front, yes, it's coming in front. You can see the missing half plane that we have here, and you have blue atoms which are representing the dislocation line. Okay, so we have series of planes on either side, but on one particular plane, the half plane is missing, and as a consequence, there is a dislocation. Note that the dislocation line is perpendicular here. That's the blue line, okay? And uh, you can see how the atoms are pulled together, and here the atoms are spaced more widely apart, whereas up here, around the dislocation, they'll be pulled together closer. So this visually portrays for us what is an edge dislocation. Okay? And if we can imagine that these, this dislocation now wants to move in this direction under a force, it is very easy. All this has to do is to move slightly, if a small distance, and then this dislocation will come here, and this part of the plane will be attached to the dislocation. And so on, it works its way down till the extra half plane comes out here. So we end up, if this dislocation moves through the crystal, with an extra step on the edge there. And the important thing to remember, as we'll see later, is that the step is characterized, by, uh, the uh, dislocation is characterized by something called a Burgers vector, and the relationship between the Burgers vector and the dislocation line is one of the important things that distinguishes the uh, screw and the edge dislocation. Let me tell us what, give us the uh, definition here. I have to sort of work my way around. The symbol is B for the Burgess vector, and it characterizes the strength of the dislocation and the direction of the dislocation. All right? And you can imagine that there is a perfect lattice as usual. All right? And the way to understand the idea of the Burgess vector is, let's put atoms here. And then we'll work our way around what is called a loop. Now, there are different ways of doing this. I'll just illustrate one of them. Let's start at a particular atom. Let us say this one. Okay? And then I'm going to go three atoms more to the right, okay? And then we will go three atoms up over here, three atoms across, and then three atoms down. You can do this clockwise or anti-clockwise, all right? Now what happens that if instead of the perfect lattice, we have a dislocation, When we repeat that process here, okay, below 
there is no atom here. I shouldn't draw that there, sorry. This is the last of the set of atoms. Below this, there are no atoms in this plane. And if you repeat a similar loop around this dislocation now, all right, I start from here and I work my way around this loop. There's no set of atoms here. So I count, or let me begin from here. I count three, okay? One, two, three. And then I go up three. So I moved in this direction. I went up three here. And then I count three. That brings me back to here. Did I get that right? Yeah. And then we come down here, three. I end up at a different atom compared with the atom I started from, unlike in the case where we had a perfect lattice. And this difference here, which is in this simple case equal to this distance, is what gives us the Burgers vector. So we will define this as the Burgers vector. The Burgers vector has a direction. In this case, the direction is from the finish there to the start. So that's my Burgers vector there. Okay? We can uh, look, go back here and see if I count a similar number back here. I'm always completing the loop and start ending back where I started from, whereas I complete the loop here, I do not uh, come back to the starting atom. That is because there is a plane of atoms that is missing there. And probably this is not the uh, best way to explain the Burgess vector, but I'm not going into great detail in it. But if we know the Burgess vector for the uh, dislocation, we can identify then various uh, properties of it. It tells us something about the strength of the dislocation. Now, remember, the dislocation line itself is perpendicular like this, okay, into the plane of the paper. And the Burgess vector then is perpendicular to the dislocation line. Okay? Are you with me? So in the case of an edge dislocation, the Burgess vector lies perpendicular. The line is this way, and the, Bur the Burgess vector is perpendicular to it. There are many conventions that are used. In this case, a positive, we can call a dislocation positive or negative. A positive edge dislocation is defined when we have the extra half plane inserted from the top, okay, I could have viewed the uh, dislocation as either having the half plane from the top or half plane from the bottom. The idea is the similar. In this case, a positive edge dislocation has the extra half plane from the top dislocation line going into the plane of the paper. clockwise loop. I described earlier an anti-clockwise loop, but if we follow this convention, then we will describe that as a positive edge dislocation, and the opposite of that would be a negative edge dislocation, the dislocation line coming out of the paper. If we go back, we can see to the diagram of the dislocation itself. This strain field is what affects many of the properties of the dislocation, uh, of the crystal. Because of the strain field that is at, around this dislocation, many of the electronic properties are affected as a consequence. You get more scattering from dislocations and things like that as a consequence of the strain field. And the energy that is required to create a dislocation, if you remember, we talked about the formation energy of uh, point defects. And we saw that they were roughly of the order of a few electron volts. The energy of formation for a dislocation is of the order of, say, 100 electron volts. All right? And the units is 100 electron volts per centimeter. You see, the dislocation uh, has a length. It's a one-dimensional defect. And so to create that length, it's about 100 electron volts per centimeter. And you can remember that for a point defect in comparison, it was of the order of a few EV. So one point defect can be much more easily created than a dislocation. 
Let's come to the second kind of dislocation, which is the screw dislocation. In this case, the, uh, the key idea is that there is a shearing motion. And we end up then with a figure something like this. I'll try to draw it as best as I can and then illustrate it for you with a model. It's as if the top part of this crystal has been sheared with respect to the bottom half. And in this case, I have my Burgess vector given by this step here as usual. But the dislocation line lies along this. So as you will see, the Burgess vector then, in the case of a screw dislocation, is parallel to the dislocation line. Okay? And we can see that here in this model that you can see, hopefully, from the front, if you look, we will see that uh, this part of the crystal, or let me hold it this way first for you, you can trace this black line okay, that is going across that. And if we work our way around this crystal and come back, we see that the black line ends up over here. You can see the displacement between the black line here and the black line here. And if I turn it edge on for you, you can see that there is this step that we just saw in the figure. The front part of this crystal is lower than the back part there. Okay, it's been sheared with respect to each other. So this is what the screw dislocation looks like. And some of these are uh, difficult to visualize um, when we deal with real materials and real crystals. But I just thought I'll put it up there as a model to give you an idea what you will be actually seeing. So we have uh, B parallel to dislocation line for edge dis uh, screw dislocations and B parallel uh, perpendicular to the dislocation line for edge dislocations. Reality is a little bit different. And very often, there are mixed dislocations. Okay? To understand this, let us... Any, uh, write it as, any given dislocation has only one Burgess vector. All right? And the second thought is that dislocations don't, these are just some general ideas about dislocations that will lead us to what are missed dislocations. Dislocations cannot just end in a crystal. Either it comes to the surface or it can form loops. Okay, so it has come out to the surface, the dislocation, creating that extra half step there. Or there's a loop or sometimes there is a network of dislocations. So there will be nodes. But uh, a dislocation just doesn't go into a crystal somewhere and pop, just stop halfway in there. Now, if we have a loop, try to imagine what would be the case. I'm defining a dislocation loop with a Burgess vector given by this. Now, you look at the loop carefully. This part of the loop, this is my dislocation line. The Burgess vector is parallel or perpendicular to B. What is it? Over here in the loop, this part of the loop the Burgess vector is parallel or perpendicular? Parallel. parallel to the loop. Okay, this is the dislocation line. The Burgess vector is here. So what kind of a dislocation is it? Screw. It's a screw dislocation. And out here, what is it? Screw. It's still a screw because we still have parallel to the Burgess vector. One is a right-handed screw. One is a left-handed screw. It's similar to the idea of positive and negative edge dislocations. We have a right-handed screw and a left-handed screw. What about in this segment here? This is a pure edge, and so is this. 
because the dislocation line is perpendicular to the Burgers vector. Now the question arises, what about all these intermediate areas? And that is where the dislocation is said to have a mixed character. Here it is pure screw, here it is pure edge, here it is pure screw, here it is pure edge. And all other places in between are a mixture of the edge and the screw. And therefore we have mixed dislocations. The Burgess vector is useful also in categorizing something known as the dislocation energy. <coughs> Always, whether a dislocation forms or actually a dislocation could um, dissociate, break up, all this det is determined by the energy of the system. If it is more favorable for the dislocation to form, the, in terms of energy it will form, and if it's more favor favorable for it to uh, break up, it will do so. And in general, the energy is proportional to the Burgess vector squared. All right? The energy of a dislocation is proportional to the Burgess vector squared. And typically, a system wants to minimize its energy, and therefore, the dislocation will try to have the smallest possible Burgess vector. Okay? Since the measure of the energy is the uh, Burgess vector squared, so a dislocation will always be trying to have smallest possible Burgess vector. And uh, typically this Burgess vector is the lattice constant, which in the case of a cubic crystal is simply A. It may try to be larger than A, 2A, multiples of it. You can imagine that instead of having one step, it's two steps away, and so on. Okay? But it's also possible for it to have partial values, which give us then partial dislocations. So these are fractions of the lattice constant. Not multiples, in this case, fractions of the lattice constant, say half, one-fourth, one-sixth, these are all typical. It can't have any arbitrary value because um, the atoms are at some fixed positions, so it can't uh, take on any arbitrary value. But these are some fractional possibilities, and therefore we have dislocations that are known as partial dislocations. In the case of a screw dislocation, the calculation of the energy, I just told you it's proportional to B squared, is um, rather straightforward. And in terms of uh, uh, the energy that is required, we will get then that it is uh, GB squared <coughs> by 4 pi logarithm R by R naught. I'll tell you what are these in a second. We are imagining that there is an inner core for the dislocation. It's a bad drawing. Let me do that again. I'm pretty pathetic with drawings, huh? Even that is pretty bad. Okay. <laughs> Let me try that again. I'm not getting this right somehow. Okay. All right, there's an inner core, which has the radius R, and then we have a cylindrical type of structure that we are describing as part of this, the dislocation. This is the screw dislocation. And there is an area around it that is strained. We have the step that is created by the shear. And R0, this term here, is the radius of the core. No, um, the, because the dislocation line is there, you can best calculate the energy in these terms. In other words, the area around the dislocation is all strained, and what we're trying to imagine is what is the energy that is associated with this dislocation. Sir, so how does the cylindrical structure associate with Because when it is sheared, it is almost like shearing around the axis. Okay? I, uh, my diagram is pretty pathetic, but uh, basically uh, there is another step at the bottom here, 
And what you have to think of is like a tube that has been sheared. So it will rise up a little bit at the top and a little bit at the bottom. Uh, and we will have a sort of a cylindrical area around it that is highly strained. And that's what we are considering here in this figure, right? It's not that we've taken a cylindrical sample f to put a dislocation in it, but we're looking at a cylindrical area around the dislocation core that is defined as R0 is my core. And R, the capital R in this, is the upper limit of the strain field. That means how far does it go, the strain field? G is the shear modulus. Okay. And then B is the Burgess vector in that equation. So we can calculate the uh, energy of the dislocation this way. You see it's proportional to B squared. Almost this is like the work done to create the dislocation per unit length. I, I have one more term here which we are not using right now. Say we'll call that the length of the dislocation. So the energy per unit length that, that's required to create this dislocation is, in this case of the screw dislocation, GB squared by 4 pi, the natural log, R by R naught. Again, proportionality with B squared. What are the different properties where we have the motion of dislocations influencing the property? One of the obvious ones is slip. If you study mechanical properties of materials, it is obvious that the motion, slip motion, part of a crystal sliding with respect to the other is created due to dislocation motion. So these dislocations can move around when stress is applied to them. And as I told you earlier, uh, it is easier for us to visualize it as a plane by plane motion that goes across the system. All right? It is the, the half plane that is there is quickly attached to one plane, then the half plane moves on to the next one, and so on and works. And this is how the top part of the crystal has slid with respect or slipped with respect to the bottom part. And obviously, there are slip planes where it is easier for this motion to occur. So in a given crystal, we th talk in terms of there are some easy sliding directions, and those are referred to as the slip planes, where there are fewer bonds to break. Can you imagine what might be some of the slip planes, say, in a, a FCC structure, face-centered, uh, close-packed structure? I've told you that there should be fewer bonds to break. One, one, one. Okay? 111 one has got the highest packing density, and therefore the interplanar bonds are fewer, right? And therefore, the 111 planes become the easier planes to slip along. Okay. The other area where dislocation motion is important in, again, mechanical properties is, say, work hardening. We can take a softer metal and work it, do things to it. And as a consequence of working it or applying various stresses to it, we are generating dislocations. And in the process of work hardening, there are so many dislocations formed. It's just a tangle of dislocations, often referred to as a forest of dislocations. And it is this entanglement of the dislocations that prevents further slip and sliding motion because they're all so tangled up together. And that's what allows the softer metal to be made harder by work hardening. Another important area where the uh, dislocation is useful is in crystal growth. You remember there is a step that is created by the screw dislocation. And we can imagine a surface where I'm trying to grow a crystal. So I have a substrate surface. As usual, my drawings are confusing, but I will try. Okay, Because of the presence of a dislocation here, there is a step that has been created. So the surface is not absolutely flat. There is a step there. Now imagine there is an atom that has come from either from solution or from 
the vapor phase and has landed on this substrate. If it attaches itself to one of these surface points, there are fewer atoms for it to attach itself to as compared with if it chooses to attach itself to the edge of this step. Do you get that? Because the step is exposing other planes, it is favorable for the atom to come and attach itself to this exposed step rather than to a flat surface. And as a consequence, the growth then takes place by attachment of atoms to the step. And as more and more atoms are attached, this begins to spiral round and round. And so the consequence of it is if you look at the surface, we see spiral growth. So there will be features that look like this after growth. Because the atoms that have attached keep on moving, more and more come and attach, and it generates what is known as a growth spiral. Not all growth is taking place by this method, but there are a number of crystals where this is the way that growth is taking place. It simplifies the growth procedure. It's much easier to grow when you have that one dislocation sitting there. Now, the trick is if you're trying to grow single crystalline material and you have many dis screw dislocations and therefore many steps, so that means different uh, atoms will go to different steps. And so instead of generating a nice single crystalline growth, I'm going to end up with polycrystalline growth. Okay, let's draw that a little better. I think that's where I've failed to... Uh, we don't have anything there. All right. This is my crystal surface on which I'm going to try to grow some more layers. This process of crystal growth. And because of the presence of a dislocation, the bottom, the back part of it has sheared up, and so we have an exposed step here. If an atom comes and tries to sit here, it may stick there. It may not. Okay? There are fewer atoms on the surface as compared with a position like here. Because it can make bonds both with the bottom surface as well as with the edge that is sticking up there. Are you able to follow that? Okay? So it's easier, more favorable for atoms that are trying to deposit on this to come and stick here because they are more likely to attach themselves to the step. Okay? So what happens is that an atom sticks here, some stick here, and then that now this step has come this side. All right? And then again it will become this way and this way and this way. And so eventually what happens is that when we look at the surface, we see a spiral like this. The atoms have uh, attached themselves, say, around this dislocation. There was a step, and then it starts spiraling round and round. So the top view, when we look at the crystal that has finished growing, looks like a series of steps that are spiraling around. You know a spiral staircase? Eh? The staircase, and you go around it like that. Basically, that's the kind of idea. It's uh, very flat, of course, unlike the spiral <coughs> staircase that takes you from first floor to second floor of your house, maybe. In this case, my staircase is very, very shallow because it's only adding on one atom at a time. But it's basically the crystal is sort of, atoms are walking up this loop, a spiral that is created there. And it's very uh, useful in growth that if I, uh, it's easier for atoms to grow when there is that step available. And this was known as, I think, Frank's screw dislocation theory for explaining crystal growth, why it is so easy in certain cases, that the presence of the step there makes it easier for the atoms to attach themselves. Okay, So I know, for example, um, silicon carbide, well, some of the first pictures that uh, were taken for the spiral growth were in a material called silicon carbide that I worked with. And you can see uh, as the crystal growth proceeds, I don't remember if I brought that crystal along. I, I thought I had it. I forgot to put it out, I think. Um, you, you can see spirals that are growing on the surface. It's very clear to see under a microscope. Okay, So uh, uh, dislocation motion is something that aids... Uh, the presence of the dislocation is something that is aiding crystal growth in this case. In earlier cases, like slip I was saying, dislocation motion helps that. Again, when dislocations don't move and get tangled up, we get work hardening, which is useful in certain cases. Again, the presence of a screw dislocation step is aiding crystal growth. So how dislocations play a role in different properties and different processing techniques? 
And what I was trying to point out was, let's say there's two dislocations here, each with its own step. So what happens is now atoms want to spiral here, some want to spiral here, and so we get boundaries and things like that. So the growth is not very good if you have lots and lots of dislocations on the surface. Okay? Let me do one thing is to show you, since I'm on the topic, a few pictures that I will give you. How do we know there are dislocations? This was just postulated, I told you. Somebody just wanted to explain some properties, and so they postulated long back the presence of dislocations. But it took the coming of the electron microscope, particularly the transmission electron microscope, that allows us to look at crystals and their structure in great detail. And we can then say whether a, a crystal has got dislocations or not. Let me show you a few pictures by way of illustrating the point. When we have a picture that is taken in the electron microscope, I'll put it up this way. This is what's called a cross-sectional electron microscopy picture. There is a film that has grown on a substrate. Okay? And this is done by thinning the sample down so that the sample is now transparent to the electron. An electron can just pass through it, and that's how we get this image. Okay? What we are seeing here is this is the interface between the uh, upper layer that has been grown and the substrate. And all these things that are in there are defects. You see these lines lying at certain angles? They are stacking faults and twins, which we are coming to, that are lying at this interface. The higher you go, you see there's fewer of those, and right at this interface, there's so many that the place basically looks black. And so what we see here is, uh, in this particular case, because what we have grown on top here is very, very different in terms of lattice uh, constant from the substrate, what kind of dislocations we have generated? So there's a lot of misfit dislocations right at this interface. But in addition, there's a number of other defects, which I named the stacking faults and twins. And you see they lie at particular angles. There's a geometry to it. Again, it's easier to form these on certain planes. And since this is a single crystalline structure, albeit defective, we have them lying on certain planes. Now what we can do is, after seeing a picture like this, I can take diffraction images of the crystal. Just like you do X-ray diffraction, I can do electron diffraction. And in electron diffraction, if the crystal is perfectly single crystalline, what we will see is something like this. The series of spots that you see are not atoms. They are planes. Each plane produces a spot in this diffraction pattern. Much like each plane produces a peak in your X-ray diffraction pattern, here we are seeing each plane is producing a series of spots. And what do we have here? All you can see are well-arranged spots there. And from this now I can make, let's say that is the transmitted beam in the center, knowing the various distances and the directions with respect to each other, I can calculate and index this pattern, determine which plane has produced which spot. And this tells me now, looking at a picture like this, that the crystal that was grown is very nice. Okay? What happens if the crystal that is grown uh, is not very nice? Uh, before that, let me put up another one. What I showed you earlier here is what we call a plan view picture. That means... I have taken, uh, let me go back to the paper for a second. We have a sample that we grew, and I thinned it down, and then it is thin enough now of the order of some angstroms, nanometers, uh, very, very thin, and there are special techniques to do this. And then my electron beam is hitting from the top here, and I'm getting an image here, which you saw is the series of spots like this. Okay, that is this image. What I could also do is, especially if I've grown one material on another, is to create an interface that I can look at. So I took my starting material. There is an interface here because I've grown one material on another. And I cut this sample, turn it around, lay it flat, and then look at the cross-section. So that gives me information, say I look... I can thin it down and look at this area, which is what you saw in this image. So I can see both the film that I grew and the substrate. 
I can also take a diffraction pattern from such a picture. In that case, it will look something like this. All right? And what you see here are now uh, the transmitted beam in the center and pairs of spots. If you see around this spot, there's a smaller spot attached to it. And then further out, another pair. And they're all coincidental. So if I draw lines along here, there will be uh, lines that pass through these pairs of spots. And what this tells me is, in the, in the case of uh, this diffraction pattern, the closer is the uh, spot to the central spot, the larger is the lattice constant or the lattice parameter there. So in this case, this spot, the closer spot in each of these cases, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, are produced by the substrate, which was silicon. And silicon has a lattice parameter of 5 point uh, something angstroms. And what I grew on it was a crystal silicon carbide, which has a lattice parameter of 4 point something. So in that case, the spot is farther outside. But by looking at a picture like this, first of all, it tells me again that it's single crystalline. Secondly, it tells me that the planes in my film are exactly parallel to the planes in my substrate. Because this spot lies parallel to this one. If the spot had been moved off somewhere else, that is telling me that there is some misorientation in my, subs in my film with respect to the planes in the substrate. So if I took a substrate that was 100 and I grew a film, what this picture tells me is that the, the 100 planes of my film are parallel to the 100 planes of my substrate. I could have it that it's growing a different way and it's still single crystalline. But in this case, what it's showing me is that they are parallel. And uh, when we look at a diffraction pattern of something that is really, well, not very nice, okay? There's lots of defects in this picture. You can still see there are spots. So overall, we may say that the um, <coughs> film is not bad, but uh, you can see because of the presence of those defects which I showed you earlier, these dislocations and so on, a picture of a diffraction pattern from somewhere there may look something like this. You see these little uh, lines, I don't know if you can see it, running uh, at angles. Okay, they are all related to um, the stacking faults and things like that. And if you had a case where it is polycrystalline, you begin to see rings. You can see rings superimposed on the spots. So in the case of TEM, the presence of the spots, clear spot pattern, indicates that it is single crystalline over here. And when I start seeing rings, one ring here and then fainter rings are there which you cannot see, see over here, that tells me that there is a polycrystalline nature to the sample. Okay? So I can make use of this actually uh, to understand. I see dislocations here. Uh, in a higher image if I go, a higher magnification, I can see dislocations and I verify that these things are real and not simply somebody's imagination that they postulated it just for convenience. I can understand if my crystals are single crystalline, polycrystalline, and so on. So that tells me something about the uh, defects that are known as dislocations as well as overall crystal structure. A few more points with defects. Let's look at surface defects, which are or known as planar defects. So, so far I looked at point defects, zero-dimensional, line defects, which are one-dimensional, and then now we've come to these two-dimensional defects. The most obvious one will be a surface. And you say a surface, a defect? Yes. You remember I told you that the bonds that are there at the surface are very different compared with what is happening in the bulk. Using again my two-dimensional network here, you can see that the atom in here has, is attached to four other atoms around it. But the ones at the surface are attached only to three of them. So in terms of, uh, if you look at the definition of defect which you gave, a disruption, disturbance in the periodicity of the structure. Here everywhere, everything is periodic, and then you get to the surface, something is different. And so in that sense, every surface is a defect. Okay? So uh, when I take a silicon wafer, clean and uh, pure and high quality as it may be, very low dislocation density, just because it has a surface, in a sense, that is a defect. And so we have to make sure 
in different ways how we handle the surface by cleaning and other techniques. You see, these bonds may not just simply sit there, and that's why the surface will be different from the bulk. Two of these bonds next to each other, these are called dangling bonds, by the way. Two of them may decide to combine with each other. A bond just sitting up there like that is energetic. Okay, increases the energy. So they may try to minimize their energy by combining with each other. So two dangling bonds combine with each other and this, uh, this process can go on periodically thereby minimizing the energy. So all these dangling bonds sticking out are minimizing their energy by uh, combining with each other and that process is known as reconstruction. And so a surface in many cases is not our idealized picture of atoms sitting like this the surface atoms have reconstructed themselves and therefore they may have a different symmetry from the atoms in the bulk. And a different symmetry often means different properties. So just this process of recomb re recombining with each other creates a different symmetry on the surface and we get different properties for the surface. We could also have that uh, to minimize its energy, it adsorbs say a hydrogen atom, <coughs> I'm sorry, hydrogen atom, a hydrogen atom going around looking for another electron, this has a dangling bond which means there is a free electron there available for bonding and so the hydrogen attaches itself there conveniently and uh, this process can go on till all my surface is covered with hydrogen. The only thing is that it's fairly strong but if you heat up the material the hydrogen will start coming off, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Unlike the bonds that are here, which are much stronger, these bonds on the surface are weaker. And so my adsorbed bonds, you can have either they are chemically adsorbed, chemisorbed, or it's a physisorbed, sorry. All right? and instead of hydrogen, something else may attach, and so on. So all, all materials will have this defect called a surface. The second two-dimensional defect that is very important is a grain boundary. The distinction between a single crystalline material and a polycrystalline material is that in a single crystalline material we saw all the planes and the whole material is just one single crystal. So if I look through a single crystalline material, I'll find planes arranged all throughout the material in the same way. Sets of planes are there. But what I see in a polycrystalline material is that there are regions within which this is true and then there are other regions. Again, within that, it's all well arranged, but between them, we have rotated, we have turned. So there's a misorientation between the planes in here and here, and you can extend that. So we have these things called grains as a consequence. Each of this is a grain, and then the region between them is the grain boundary, which, as I explained earlier, is a two-dimensional defect because it is a surface. Okay? And all kinds of interesting things can happen at grain boundaries because there the atoms are different. The, the arrangement of atoms is different. You know, the atoms on this line were walking and going or connecting up, and when it comes here, all of a sudden, the orientation is something different. And so at a grain boundary, we may have more space than usual. Okay? So here are all grains, and in between, it's a little more loosely packed. And then what may happen is that some impurities may like to sit there. So very often, we have impurity segregation to a grain boundary. So impurities uh, like that available space there and preferentially move to the grain boundary. 
So there's a lot more impurities in here, let us say, than within the grain. Okay? So this can create problems. Sometimes it's nice, sometimes it's create problems. In terms of electronics, typically what we are looking for is this kind of structure, the single crystalline structure. There is a periodicity to it. There may be point defects and things like that, but there's a basic periodicity. If I take a material like this, and current is flowing through this, what will happen? Within each grain, it sees exactly the same thing as if it was a single crystalline material. But what happens when it hits a grain boundary, an electron that is moving through the crystal? Okay, we are coming to terms that we will uh, use more later. Mobility will decrease, he says. Fundamentally, there is scattering, a higher scattering probability from grain boundaries because the periodicity is broken. Uh, very simple. You're walking, you know, uh, down the corridor and suddenly somebody comes out of a door in the, in the corridor and you go slam into it. Okay, your mobility is decreased. You get hurt too. But uh, you were headed in one direction, all of a sudden, your mobility is decreased. They are scattered. Okay? So grain boundaries play a very important role in electronic properties because they increase the scattering. Here's another one of the 2D. A twin. Now, in real life, we know what's a twin. It should look identical to the other one. And uh, in crystals, what we mean by a twin is that there is a part in the crystal as if there is a mirror. And all the atoms on this side of this twin plane or twin boundary have this orientation, whatever plane we are choosing. And whatever we have on the other side of this twin boundary is a mirror image Okay? So the same plane that above the twin boundary, twin plane, lies like this, below it is a reflection as if in a mirror. And so this is known as a twin plane. A mirror image on either side. And these twins can form either by deformation, and then they will be known as deformation twins, or during annealing. Okay. Twins can also be produced during the growth process itself. Some of what I showed you here, the defects in this particular picture, are actually twins there. I can't show it to you at this magnification, but at higher magnifications we were able to see that there are twins. There are areas where there are mirror images when you go and look at very high magnifications. So these are what are called twins. There's one final 2D defect that we'll talk about and that is a stacking fault. All right. And basically, if you remember, say for example in the case of FCC, what was the stacking sequence? A, B, C, A, B, C, right? So I've got a part of the crystal where they are arranging themselves plane by plane, A, B, C, A, B, C, and so on. And somewhere in between, as it is stacking some part, for whatever reason, the stacking sequence is now changed. And then it restores, let's say. But here it's going to, or, or let's put it this way, A, B, C, uh, right? Yeah, somewhere here, instead of uh, continuing as ABC, it s switched. So that's what's called a stacking fault. It's as if we are stacking boxes one on top of the other, and we were told to put the red boxes on top of the blue, and the blue on top, you know, of the, the greens on top of the red, and so on. And while doing it, I forgot, and I misplaced the stacking. And this creates a problem. Usually, the stacking fault is uh, correct. It will correct itself after a while, and we'll get a region... Uh, B, C, A, and then again B, C, A, and then again maybe it will start correcting itself. So there will be a region that is enclosed between two dislocations that is a, a, a faulted region, and then the areas on either side are typically normal regions again. 
But within that, with respect to the normal regions on either side, we have faults that are generated. Okay. One uh, final thought I'll give you as far as uh, surfaces, that most surfaces have a behavior that can be modeled by what is known as the TLK model or the terrace ledge kink model. It's also referred to as COSEL model in many cases. And fundamentally then, the surface will look like this. This is what is referred to as the terrace, a flat surface. And this part here is the ledge, the side of the step. Okay? So there's a terrace, and then it comes down to another terrace, separated by a step, and the side of the step here is a ledge. And then we may have that one atom came and attached itself to this step, we could also have, if this was a continuous, an area where something is missing like that. You see, on, in, with respect to the step, a uh, flat surface here, I told you earlier it's more difficult to sit here and attach itself, whereas if it comes and attaches itself to a step edge, like in the case of the uh, screw dislocation, it would attach itself more easily. Imagine we have a site like this where there are three surfaces, one, two, three, and the bottom available for attachment. There, that's something called a kink. And the side here is the ledge, terrace. Okay? So we have the terrace, ledge, and the kink. And a typical surface looks somewhat like this. You may even have missing atoms in here. Extra atoms that are absorbed from the surface out here. Okay? So this is in reality what a step may look like, and uh, we can artificially create steps by cutting a plane at a slightly wrong angle. So instead of it being perfectly flat, the surface of the crystal we imagine is the 100 plane, I choose to cut it at a slight angle of, say, 3 degrees or so. And what happens then is that the surface rearranges itself to look something like this, a series of steps where this is my angle what I'm imagining ma macroscopically is this surface, that is the normal to the surface, but actually it consists of a series of micro steps where this is the surface, uh, the normal to the planes. So this is the surface normal, and this is the plane normal. And that angle between them is that three degrees with which I cut it. So I can artificially modulate the structure to create this kind of steps which are suitable for certain types of growth. That brings us to the last kind of defect, the bulk or 3D defects. Obviously, uh, we can uh, talk about these very simple things. Inclusions, you know, some junk fell in, precipitates, and voids. So these are the three kinds of things that we may find in bulk uh, defects. And uh, we try to avoid them in the normal situation because we do not want them in the material. A couple of pictures I leave. These are both uh, scanning electron micrographs of what are voids, big holes inside a crystal. Okay? These are both voids and uh, we do not want these kind of defects in the crystal. With that, uh, we'll close and we'll take up another topic the next time.